there's this term used in pediatrics. Pediatricians often will use the term failure to thrive. And they use the term failure to thrive as a way of indicating when young children are experiencing insufficient weight gain. In other words, they're not existing in their optimal state of being. Something is lacking or missing for them. And the thing is, many people, not just infants or toddlers, exhibit their own failure to thrive. Such persons are getting by in their day-to-day lives. They're surviving, but they're not thriving. Something is lacking or missing for them. And we believe that our Heavenly Father intended for us to live differently. When our God finished creating the universe, he said it was very good. The Lord's intent for his creation was for it to flourish. As we t- and again, this is, this is back to just defining flourishing last week. As part of God's creation, as we who are made in the Lord's image, God cares about who we are as human beings. In fact, he desires to develop us into a certain kind of people. Persons who learn, who grow, who mature into our best selves. Another word that we might use for flourishing is prospering, but as we talked about last week, biblically, flourishing is not about gaining God's favor. Our creator is not a vending machine. Flourishing is not about pushing the right buttons, doing the right things in order to get the Lord to pour down his blessings on us. No, properly understood, the biblical vision of flourishing, what we might call the good life, is a life that is centered in God. Our Father's covenant love, centered in our Father's moral order and design, centered in our Father's sovereignty over time and history, centered in our Father's ultimate promise to make all things, including us, new. For me, a fantastic word that encompasses the biblical idea of flourishing is the Hebrew word shalom. And if you've been with our community for a while, you've probably heard me use that word before in sermons. And this word shalom, as I've talked about, we normally translate as peace, you know. But shalom has so much more to it than this idea of peace of mind or the absence of conflict or a ceasefire between opposing forces. This beautiful, rich Hebrew word shalom equates to wholeness, wholeness in every direction. Shalom, in other words, is life existing the way it ought to be. And and this ties into this idea of flourishing. Our Father has ordered and structured creation to work in a way that benefits the life he has given us, that enables us to excel and become who we were created to be. In fact, the Lord is so committed to this desire for us, he came down to us in Jesus Christ to clear the way, to reveal the truth, and to give us the life we were meant for. The key to human flourishing, biblically, is being rooted in Christ. That's where we ended last week, and that leads us right into what you heard from the Gospel of John. And I hope you still have that open. If not, you can turn to it. John chapter 15, to be looking at it. Because as we get into John, this is another passage that just reflects this biblical idea of flourishing from the mouth of Jesus himself, of what does it mean when we talk about flourishing or thriving? What does this kind of life look like? And if you were listening, or if you're reading it now, you see the key word that Jesus uses in this passage is the word abide. He says, he is the vine, we are the branches. Abiding, as Jesus tries to make visually clear through this image, is about remaining, abiding, remaining in him, in Christ. And he just points to the, to the, 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 the parallel in nature. A branch must always be connected to the main vine. It is from the vine that the branch receives all of its nourishment, its life. If the branch is cut off from the vine, the branch dies. Now, the branch might get cut off, and when it's first cut off, it might look hardy and lush, looking healthy for a season, but ultimately, eventually, the branch will die. To flourish, we must be grafted. We must be rooted in Christ. And you heard Jesus himself, very sobering words, caution us that apart from him, We can do nothing. We can do nothing. Now, last week, and as we go further this week, I really hope that you begin to see that for followers of Jesus, the concept of human flourishing goes so much deeper and extends much wider than our cultural definition of flourishing, our cultural understanding of of thriving. I mean, from the world's vantage point, excelling in life means immediate gratification and material acquisition. But... The thing is, what we often equate with success, what we often measure as flourishing, 
is nothing more than a temporal burst of activity. I mean, titles change, right? You know, if that's what you're gunning for. Reputations shift if that's what you're all about. Fame doesn't last forever. Parties, if you love to party, parties eventually end. Food and drink, and we all love food and drink. We relish food and drink. Food and drink are perishable. All resources that we have, cars, houses, boats, vacation properties, money, investments, whatever, All of our resources deplete or eventually change hands. These crops that we enjoy now or we spend our whole lives chasing after, they ultimately wither and fade. None of them endure. None of them endure in their ability to satisfy. I mean, we're always left wanting more. And none of them endure in their shelf life. They cannot go the distance. There's no resurrection for them. In all these things that come into our mind right now, despite what the world promises us, despite what we often convince ourselves, these are not the marks of flourishing. Biblical flourishing is about thriving and excelling, not in one short burst, but in an ongoing progression of positive development. That's the picture that Jesus gives us here. Biblical flourishing is about living a full An abundant life, a life marked by continuity between now and then, between here and eternity. In other words, as Jesus puts it simply, flourishing is about fruitfulness. Flourishing is about cultivating fruit, much fruit, fruit that lasts. True flourishing, lasting fruit comes from abiding in the vine from abiding in Christ. And you notice, again, if you're reading it or if you were listening, twice Jesus equates abiding, remaining connected to him, he he equates it with his words. Verse seven, or his commands, verse 10. In other words, we flourish, and and again, this this is just right back to the definition we had last week. We flourish as we learn from and follow Jesus in terms of how to live the way God intended. Jesus, as God made flesh, reveals humanity at its best. And I unpacked this a lot more last week. But Paul talks about Jesus as being the second Adam. Jesus is the second Adam who shows us our humanity as it was intended to be. We think what it, we know what it means to be human, but we've got it all wrong. The first Adam did not reflect how we were created to be, who we were created to be. So Paul writes of Jesus as being the second Adam who not only gives us life, but shows us the kind of life we were meant to live. We thrive as we follow Jesus, as we learn from and live like Christ. And that brings us back in the midst of being in John 15 to a passage we were looking at before. And if you want to look at it while I'm talking, that's awesome. It's Matthew's chap- Matthew chapters 5 through 7, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at that briefly last week, but we go back to that. Because this simple, straightforward, and immensely practical teaching that covers three chapters in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, reflects Jesus' essential teachings about shalom. This idea of existing in God-centeredness, the way things are supposed to be, the way life is supposed to work. And as I mentioned last week, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, if it comes to your mind right now, in this sermon, Jesus is not laying down laws or calling us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. No, in this sermon, Jesus is offering us a startling invitation to inhabit the world as God created it to be. The Sermon on the Mount parallels John 15 in that it's a description of what real flourishing is, of what living life based on our Father's design and desire for us looks like. And so what do we see? What do we see in what Jesus reveals to us in the picture that Jesus paints? What does biblical flourishing functionally look like? And that's what we're talking about this morning. We've defined it, but what does it functionally, practically look like? And we see it in what, John, in what Jesus lays out in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And the picture that Jesus paints And again, if you can be reading it as I'm talking, but if it comes to mind, because this is a very famous teaching, a flourishing life for Jesus is a life lived out of love instead of hate. A flourishing life is a life lived out of love, love that instead of aiming for retaliation born of outrage, dares to pursue reconciliation for the sake of healing. Love that flourishes, Jesus describes, is radical sacred love that instead of taking the other person to court for a pound of flesh, risks walking the extra mile to get to know one's professed enemy. 
not as a stereotype, not as a soundbite, but as a flesh and blood person. Getting to know that person, even to the point of offering the one we vehemently oppose the shirt off of our back. That's what flourishing looks like. A flourishing life, Jesus goes on in this sermon, is a life that refuses to see, that refuses to objectify, to use and victimize another person out of lust, choosing instead to cherish and protect the dignity of all people. The kind of eyes that flourish are the kind of eyes that have the divine sight that looks for the light in the darkness, that doesn't ignore the log in one's own eye, but is more than willing to see those who are in need and act accordingly never promising what we won't deliver, not calling attention to ourselves, but instead always giving the glory to God. That's a flourishing life. A flourishing life, as Jesus paints it, as Jesus describes it, is a life marked by fidelity instead of infidelity. A life noted for its honesty instead of its dishonesty. A life expressed through personal confession and repentance rather than the presumptuous judgment of others. A flourishing life is a life that relies on God's provision, serving the Lord alone as master, relying on God's provision instead of worrying about controlling tomorrow and everything that comes with it. A flourishing life, Jesus describes, wisely builds on the foundation God has laid out. All that the Lord gives, rather than trying to weather the storm on one's own, rather than living in denial of the vine from which all life originates, moves, and has its being. If we want a practical, tangible picture of what human flourishing looks like, that's what Jesus gives us here. It's a, it's a powerful, but again, in, intensely practical. It's where we live day after day. It's a dynamic portrait of what the harvest of the kingdom of God looks like. For me, what we find in Jesus' picture in the Sermon on the Mount is a very practical picture of what Paul talks about when he invokes this idea of flourishing, when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit in his letter to the Galatians. Think about it. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit as being love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what you see in the picture that Jesus paints is what the fruit of the Spirit tangibly and practically looks like lived out in our everyday lives. This is flourishing. Now, I'm captivated by this. I'm, it, it's beautiful. It, it, it enraptures me. It excites me. It causes me to dream and to imagine. It shifts how I look at my life. It, it, it radically alters how I look at this world we live in. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 I gravitate towards this. Because if I look around elsewhere, if I jump on Facebook, if I turn on the news... If I listen in it to conversations at Starbucks or just observe interactions between people when I'm out and about, I don't know about you, but I have to admit that there's all too little of this kind of living happening in our world today. All around us, man. I mean, maybe even in our own space of being, right? I mean, sadly, shockingly, sometimes even within the church, you know, we cannot help but notice lives that are abundant, yeah, but lives that are abundant in criticism and contention. Lives that are full, yeah, but full of division. Full of division along with this unconscionable neglect of those who are in need. People right in front of us. What, what's up? What's up with that? I mean, what's the, what's the deal? I mean, we can hear Jesus, right? I mean, I, I don't know a person who doesn't long for this life that Jesus offers and, 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 and now and again, you know, even despite ourselves, right, we, we get a taste of this kind of life that he points us towards. But the question remains, if this is God's vision of flourishing, if this is God's vision of life, the way we were meant to live it, what, what do we have to do? What do we have to do to have this kind of life? How can we follow Jesus, you know? How, how can we walk as Jesus walked? How can we live as Jesus lived? And the first part of the answer is by ourselves, we cannot live this life. By ourselves, we cannot live this life. On our own, we cannot follow Jesus. Now, you might stop and say, wait a second. You, we just heard from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and doesn't Jesus say specifically time, specifically multiple times in the back in that, in that chapter, do what I command, do what I say, do this. I mean, didn't we just hear about the Sermon on the Mount? Isn't the Sermon on the Mount, again, a list of instructions, guidelines 
for living. And I want to hit this because so many of us, this is how our filter, this is how we approach everything we hear that Jesus says, everything we see in Scripture. But the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus articulates in the Gospel of John, they're not a list of things that we are to do by ourselves. While Jesus calls us to follow him by doing what he commands, we can't work this out for ourselves. We can't. And thank God we don't have to. You know? Thank God we don't have to. We need to keep listening to Jesus. We need to keep reading the next chapter in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, because then Jesus starts to talk about the advocate, the counselor that he sends to us. Here's the thing. Jesus knows I want you to hear this this morning. Jesus knows we cannot follow him without a power beyond ourselves. Jesus knows that we cannot follow him without a strength that we do not possess on our own. His power, his strength, his life in us. And that is why Jesus sent the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit to empower us to empower us to flourish, to enable us to bear fruit. I don't know how you've heard it, but this is the story. This is the gospel. Through the forgiveness of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, and the presence and power of the Spirit deposited at Pentecost, God not only unveils the nature and goal of our redemption, but the Lord also gives us, he endows us to occupy the life we are intended to live in Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And so many people have just a very bizarre relationship, if any at all, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit assures us of the Father's love. The Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit in our lives that God gives to us, assures us that all has been forgiven in Christ. If you are a person that continues to struggle and stress, am I really forgiven? Can I really be forgiven? Then you're not tapping into the Spirit of Christ that he has given you. Because that spirit continues to assure us we are forgiven. All is forgiven. The spirit of Christ continues to assure us that he will never leave us or forsake us. And that is our foundation. That's our rock. Everything else comes out of that and the spirit grounds us in that reality. And out of that reality, the spirit continues to make us aware. We're blind to it otherwise. We justify, we rationalize, but the spirit makes us aware of our rough edges The sin in our lives that while forgiven, forgiven, it's forgiven, but the sin that is still being worked out in the habit of our lives through our confession and repentance. The Spirit enables us to look and to see. We're blind otherwise. We we look down. We don't look up. We miss things that are right in front of us. But the Spirit enables us to look and to see, to hear and to listen, to go and to encounter others as Jesus did. It's the Spirit that leads us to learn and to grow and to mature from glory to glory into the likeness of Christ. You get it? God's gracious gift of the gospel not only restores our broken relationships with him, with each other, and physical creation, but God's gracious gift of the gospel directs us through his spirit to live the abundant and everlasting life for which we were created to live, don't miss it, today. Read the Sermon on the Mount. If you haven't read it in a while, read it. And notice Jesus declares to us, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Jesus doesn't say, someday you'll be the light of the world. (laughs) Someday. You'll be the salt of the earth. Jesus doesn't assert you ought to be the light of the world. Wake up, people. You ought to be the salt of the earth. What's wrong with you? No, Jesus invites us to recognize we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. It's all about the Holy Spirit, but if it's all about the Holy Spirit, if that's it, I mean, if it's, I mean, if, it, if that's, it's about the power of the Spirit at work in us, then why? If it's that, if that's it, man, if it's that simple, then why are so many of us not flourishing in Christ? What are we missing? And it comes back to our key word here in John, the word we started with, abide. Once again, 
To abide means to remain in Christ, to remain connected to Christ. We flourish as we abide in Jesus through the word and the spirit. We flourish as we remain connected to Jesus through the word and the spirit. Abiding practically, functionally, is relying on Jesus. Abiding is resting on his word, living out of his spirit, his presence in us. Abiding, connecting with Jesus through the word and the spirit is how the wisdom of Christ flows into our lives, informing our choices, guiding our decisions, driving our actions, abiding, remaining, staying in touch with Jesus through the word and the spirit gives us his strength and resolve to carry us forward despite our apparent weaknesses and fear. Abiding, depending on Christ alone through the word and the spirit for all we need is how we bear fruit that lasts. The kind of fruit that flourishes, not for a moment, but for eternity. Here's the rub. Here's the pivot. Here is where it, what it all comes down to. Abiding is less of an action we do and more of a posture we adopt. It's less of an action we do and more of a posture we adopt. What Jesus, again, outlines in the Sermon on the Mount and expresses in this extended conversation in the Gospel of John, these are not tasks we complete or goals we meet in order to thrive. They describe the sweet spot of how to be in Christ. The particular fruit that's described, this biblical flourishing is more of an orientation to inhabit the state of grace offered to us by Jesus rather than outlining the means to grace, prerequisites we have to fulfill for thriving in Christ. I mean, following Jesus, in other words, isn't about blazing our own path, exerting our will, our steam and our smarts to figure out how to act like Christ. And for many of us, that's how we've been raised. That's what we've been taught. That's what we tell ourselves. Well, I was given the word, I've been given the spirit, and now I got to figure out how to be like Jesus. I got to figure it out. How do I live like Christ? How am I like Christ? How am, and, and, and it doesn't work. We can't figure it out. We've got the word and we've got the spirit, but we're trying by our own steam and our own smarts to figure out what do we do? What do we say? How do we act? And we spend all of that energy trying to figure out what's not ours to figure out. We don't have to figure out. We have to follow. Following Jesus is about shadowing his movement. The steps we take, every single one of them, trace his footsteps. Again, we can do this, walk as Jesus walked, live as Jesus lived, only through the gift, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But in this dance we call life, we need to let the Holy Spirit lead. I don't know many of you who like to dance. How many of you like to dance? But if you've ever gone dancing with another person, if both people try to lead, things do not go well. It's a mess. It's painful. In this dance we call life, you don't have to figure out the steps. You simply have to follow the steps that Jesus has already put out for us. And you don't even have to figure out how to follow them in your own power or strength or wisdom. You simply have to let the Holy Spirit lead you to take each of those steps. In other words, beloved, we have to commit to following the choreography the Word and the Spirit provide for us. Following Jesus Flourishing in Christ is, as the scriptures proclaim, a walk of faith. Surprise, surprise. It's something that happens day by day. And the reason why many of us aren't flourishing is because we've limited such faith to those tent poles of our life. I talked about this last week. We limit our understanding of faith to the forgiveness of our sin and our salvation from death. I mean, we believe Faith in Christ is essential for receiving the forgiveness of our sins. And we believe that faith in Christ is essential for trusting that Christ will save us from death. But we don't realize, or we just plain ignore, living by faith following Jesus is the key to flourishing with all that stuff in the middle. It's the key to everything else. 
mean, Jesus in this sermon speaks right into the heart of this. I always find every time I read the Sermon on the Mount how timely it is over more than 2,000 years ago and it jumps off the page in how it speaks to us in the 21st century. We're so fixated. Your faith is here and here. Forgiveness of sins and salvation from death, but we're totally ignorant or we just plain ignore that living by faith, following Jesus has to do with everything in the middle and Jesus speaks right into the heart of that when he says we're so busy. We're so worried. We're so fixated about managing and controlling our lives. All that stuff in the middle. It doesn't even occur to us that Jesus can and that Jesus will lead and direct us in our every day. Well, here's the other thing. And Jesus lays this out too. Flourishing, of course, takes time. Fruitfulness doesn't suddenly appear in our lives. And maybe that's another reason why we're not flourishing biblically. I mean, Jesus, again, he calls this out. We do not flourish when we run breathlessly from task to task, from experience to experience. And this is how many of us are living, man. We are just filled to the brim. And for us, we think if we're filled to the brim, we're flourishing. And the irony is we're busy, but we're tired. Life is full, but it's hectic. Man, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff I posted on Facebook. Look at all the stuff I'm doing. Man, I wish I could get a break from all the stuff I'm doing. God didn't create us to sprint through life, to burn out and fade away. And be honest, for many of us, that's the trajectory we're on. That's the Kool-Aid we're drinking, right? That's how life works, right? That's what, we have a mixed group in here, but that's how we, that's how we frame it to everybody, to each other, right? When you're young, if you're young here right now, and young means younger than me, right? <laughs> Live, do it all, stay up, never sleep, go, 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 go. Suck it all out of life because soon you're going to be me. <laughs> and then you're going to slow down. Then it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. And then eventually I'm going to be someone else in this room. And man, it's really going to get hard. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> and eventually I'm just waiting to die. In fact, I'm getting up and I'm saying, Lord, take me now. Right? Right? God didn't create us to sprint through life, to burn out and fade away. And again, that's the thing. That's what we're, we're selling for younger people. When you hear all that, just don't sleep. Don't take care of yourself. You're, you're young. You'll come back. You'll recruit. You'll, you'll bounce back. Yeah, you will until you get older, and then you'll pay for all that. That's what we don't tell you. You'll pay for all that. Then you'll be like, oh, man, oh. And instead of going, man, I should have made different decisions, we're like, man, I wish I could go back and do all that all over again. And then if we're older people, we're like, man, if I could just get something that would make me young and I'd do it all over again. You would? Really? You'd do that all over again? God didn't create us to sprint through life, to burn out and fade away. Hear this. Our Heavenly Father created us for the marathon to enjoy and grow stronger with each leg of a life that's everlasting. Forgive me, God uses young people, use lots of different people, but there's also people in the Bible that God uses that based upon our criteria, they would never get looked at because we'd have them in a retirement home. Abraham, I'm sorry, your best days are behind you. Going to build a nation out of you? I don't think so. You're lucky if you can get your breakfast down this morning, son. Moses? You're going to free the people from slavery in Egypt. World empire. God's going to bring them down through you. You know, I think you might be having some delusions, man. Maybe when you were 40 but not now. For those of us who've drunk the Kool-Aid that think that our best years are when we're young and our worst years are as we get older and we're just waiting to die, ask yourself this. If you're just waiting to die and the truth is we were created for eternity, reconcile that for me. You're waiting to die, but you were created for eternity. So you're already giving up and squandering on the rest of your life. You have your whole life ahead of you. I don't care what age you are here today. And if you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to do it all before you're 30 or you're 40. We have drunk bad mojo, bad Kool-Aid. 
Our Heavenly Father created us to enjoy and grow stronger with each leg of life that is everlasting. Our lives become fruitful. We flourish through the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we abide, as we rest in Christ and with him. And when's the last time you sat with Jesus and mark what lies before you? And in sitting with Jesus, consider where you've been. We flourish. Our lives become fruitful as we read and inwardly digest God's word and prayerfully act on it in the obedience of faith. Hear this. Flourishing, fruitfulness comes by way of practice. It comes by way of habit. And habits, we all know this. Habits are daily, intentional, conscious postures that eventually form our character and our actions. Flourishing. Fruitfulness is about following the habits of Christ. And what were the habits of Christ? He was a person of prayer. He was in the word. And he engaged other forms of worship, life as worship. He was in service to others. We don't do these things, pray, read our Bible, worship on Sunday, worship in other ways, serve others, as some kind of checklist again, so we can go, we're right with God. We don't do these things so we can go, okay, we're a good Christian, We do these things because these are the steps to follow Christ. We do these things in order to be reoriented, renewed, and reformed in terms of the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus in the midst of a world that gives us something else to drink, Kool-Aid to drink, in the midst of voices in our heads, patterns that get established. This is a counter-narrative. These are counter-habits that this is how the Spirit changes us. See, the thing is, as we abide in Christ in this way, Jesus uses the needs. He uses the opportunities and the circumstances of our lives as a training ground for us to flourish, for us to learn, to grow, and to mature into our best selves. And the thing is, we, this is so hard for us because we are told all the time, we perceive that we can only prosper when life is convenient, comfortable, and easy. And again, this gets back to that narrative I spoke of. That's why when you get older, it's hard. Because as you get older, life is no longer convenient, comfortable, or easy. This is how we think what flourishing is. It's got to be comfortable, convenient, or easy. But we talked about this last week. Surprisingly, graciously, Jesus assures us in the opening to the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, he assures us we can flourish in the midst of our struggles, our hardships, even the injustices of this world. Despite our English translation of these verses as blessings, these words from Jesus, these beatitudes, are not steps we have to climb in order to receive God's favor now or in the future. The beatitudes, again, are descriptions of our God-centeredness, that the Lord is with us and for us even as we are works in progress. Aligning ourselves with God's growth plan for our lives means relying on our Father's promise that even when life doesn't work the way it should, he is still able to work all things together for our good. Whether life is going well or not, be it a season of joy or one of sorrow, wherever we find ourselves, we can thrive in Christ. But doing so comes by abiding, that daily habit that must be practiced. And that's why Paul Peter, John, and the other writers in the New Testament tell us to earnestly seek to be filled with the Spirit each day. They tell us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to follow his lead by abiding in his words. And I want to tell you that another reason why we struggle with this, part of the reason why we don't flourish, and this is a Protestant thing, and the Protestant thing is this is the Lutheran's part of the Protestant tradition, is part of the reason why we're not flourishing is because part of the 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 legacy of our Protestant tradition is we've been taught to mistakenly equate obedience, these tangible and active practices of following Jesus with what's called workspace righteousness. 500 years ago, and it was necessary then, it was a reaction to abuse that took place within the body of Christ, but we've swung the pendulum the other way, where my gosh, if we talk about doing anything in our relationship with Jesus, it's labeled as the opposite of living by grace. My friends, hear me this morning, please. There is a huge difference between trying to earn God's favor through our obedience, what we do. There is a huge difference between that and abiding in the favor we have already been shown. 
A difference between trying to earn something with God, to merit something with God, and instead following Christ to learn and acquire the habits that enable us to occupy the grace we've already been given. And that's why, despite our Protestant tradition, the scriptures talk about Christ being formed in us, that we're called to be imitators of Christ, to have the mind of Christ, Because God's dream for the world, if you haven't heard it, God's dream for the world is that we would become fully human persons, just like Jesus was. Fully human persons. Following Jesus isn't about earning anything. Following Jesus is about pressing into the promise of his presence. It's about leaning into the experience of his amazing and limitless grace through the Spirit. It's about letting our choices, our decisions, and our actions flow out of his unconditional love for all. And again, flourishing fruitfulness do not come perfectly and they do not come immediately. They come day by day as we walk in faith and obedience following Christ. I told you last week, and and I think this is so important, when we looked at the Beatitudes, this idea that we can flourish even in the midst of pain and suffering, that Jesus models that in his own life. Flourishing in the midst of pain and suffering, that we can still, those things are not mutually opposed to each other. But Jesus also models. In the Gospels, this aspect of flourishing that I'm teasing out for you, that flourishing takes time, that flourishing is about continual growth. Pay attention to how Jesus is described throughout his life in the Gospels. I don't know if you've ever caught this before, but we are told Jesus grew in wisdom and in strength. Jesus grew in wisdom and in strength. In other words, Jesus matured into his calling. Jesus flourished over time. And this is good news because much of, the, uh, much of life, we don't know where we are, right? I mean, much of our life, we don't know where we're going. And we don't have ever all the data between where we are now and where we will be then. And what often haunts us, again, another reason why we don't flourish, what haunts us as Christians is we're always trying to be engineers. No disrespect to any engineers in the room. But we're always trying to be engineers in the Christian life. We're always trying to figure out the solution. We're always trying to anticipate and figure out the will of God. I mean, you and me, when we wake up in the morning, we're used to taking charge of our lives, right? If someone asks, what are you going to do today? We pull out our calendar and our to-do list and we lay out our agenda for the day. But notice, Jesus models a different posture. He models a different posture in how he lives. He models a posture of not always having the blueprint, if at all. Not always needing to know the solution of what our Heavenly Father is up to every time. Let me give you, I'm totally taking this from somebody else. Let me just give you a brief example of how we don't often see this in Jesus' life. Go back to the or story, or story early in John when Jesus is going to go to the wedding at Cana. You remember the wedding at Cana, right? If you remember that story, think about it this way. Jesus, when he woke up that morning, said, not yet. And by the end of the day when he was going to sleep, he went, I guess so. <laughs> Because in that story, he shows up and his mother says, hey, we're running out of wine. Turn the water into wine. And Jesus goes, it's not yet time. And then what do you know? He changes it into wine. Jesus woke up that morning and said, not yet. Went to bed and said, well, I guess so. Just chew on that for a while. (laughs) Read the Gospels. Even Jesus didn't blaze his own path. Did you know that? Jesus didn't blaze his own path. Jesus is in many ways the most uninteresting person ever. Most unoriginal, I should say, person ever. Because Jesus followed in order to flourish. Jesus followed in order to be fruitful. I said this, when we get up in the morning and someone says, all right, Chris, what are you going to do today? I'll pull out my calendar, I'll pull out my to-do list, and then I'll lay out my agenda. But again, look at how Jesus models what it looks like to be fully human, how to live the way God intended. When Jesus is asked, what are you going to do today, Jesus? What's your strategic plan, Jesus? Jesus always had the same answer. Do you remember it? I only do what my Father tells me. I'm only going to do what my Father puts before me. Even in the Gospel of John passage that we read, notice how Jesus says he's only done what his Father has directed him to do. My friends, I said this last week and I'm going to say it one more time. Flourishing in God's kingdom comes as we are where we are. Flourishing in God's kingdom is not based on where we wish we were or who we wish we were. Fruitfulness happens when we abide in Christ 
in the very places, the very situations, and the very relationships our Father puts before us. And to give you an everyday, ordinary example of what that looks like, please keep your eyes on the screen. Working in the coffee shop, for me, began as a way to fill the gap until I found a job doing what I really want to do. But hey, sometimes that dream career takes a while to get going, you know? When I first started this job, I really didn't like it. I watched the clock all day, it, it just couldn't go fast enough. Then I remembered something my dad used to always say. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. I actually think he got that from a comic strip, but he used to say it all the time. You know, dad was right. If we're always pining for the past or longing for what may lie ahead, then we'll miss what God has given us to do today. Something else my dad always said, when we work hard every day at whatever God puts in front of us, it pleases him and it's way more fulfilling for us. You know, this job might not be what I want to do forever, but it's what I'm doing right now. And you know what? That's enough for me. Where are we? How are we? Are we thriving or are we just surviving? Are our lives bearing the kind of fruit that is everlasting? Or are we chasing after the kind of stuff with a limited shelf life that no matter how hard you hold on to it is going to crumble into dust? What if we followed Jesus in order to flourish? How would our perspective on our lives, how would our experience of how we're living change radically? Would we thrive? Would we find that the kind of life we long for, the kind of life we're meant for, is right in front of us? My friends, following Jesus is not a religion. It's a practice. It's a way of living in the centeredness of who God our Father is. It's living in the centeredness of what he's done for us in Christ and in the centeredness of what he continues to offer us through his Holy Spirit. Following Jesus is the way we can flourish here and now. Abiding in Christ, learning, growing, maturing in his habits are how we flourish in the kingdom of God. And it takes time. It takes persistence. But eventually, inevitably, and eternally, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we taste and see the fruit of abiding in Christ. The fruit of flourishing. The fruit that satisfies. The fruit that lasts in the relationships we share. The fruit that lasts in the everyday and ordinary places where we work, study, and play. It's not the life we have to live. It's the life we get to live. And it begins today. Amen.